So there's so much to say today and there's so little time, uh, but what I will say is that um, I want to go into the book of Psalms this morning, Psalm 27, and we're going we're gonna to look at what David wrote. Uh, and, and I've seen this church grow over the last few months, not just in numbers, but seeing the things that God has put in front of me come to fruition, seeing acts of kindness from the people in this. always the opportunity in our quiet times for the enemy to slip in and say, you are not good enough. This morning, I want to preach. Ugh, I don't like that word. This morning, I'd like to have a conversation on how I've learned that the enemy is right. You are not enough. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. If you would open your layer, the king, very wise, also had some faults. But many would consider David a man after God's own heart. Here's his psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advances against me and devours me, it, it, it is my enemy. Verse 4 reads, one, more, one thing I ask from the Lord, the only, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon the salted above the enemies who surround me. At, at His sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your father and mother forsake me. The Lord will receive me. Teach me your way. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressions. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and sing. All right, so just a little peek into my life. I will, you know, on a, on a Tuesday, any given Tuesday, I'll get a call. And I'll need to run down to the hospital. Someone may be on death's door. Or I will go and do a little bit of grocery shopping or go find, get some things from the food bank and bring it to a family. And people will call me regularly with their needs and their prayers. Uh, praise the Lord for a great surgery, by the way. You know who I'm so talking about. The grass hadn't been mowed yet. Or then I'll get called. So, well, so we get all of the, these different things uh, that can challenge us. But then I thought, it's not just the pastor that goes through this. Even in our victories in our own lives, even when we have, you know, even when we've just got into retirement or we've gotten that raise or, or we paint that pink house or we do these different things, when we celebrate, even in our quiet times, the enemy, that Facebook post, uh, this week um, I had a visit with someone that I consider a mentor. And it was great. Um, we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about how Plant City uh, is, uh, like it or not, Plant City is getting people in by the thousands. Um, and so we talked about a number of different things, a number of different things good for ministry, but we also talked about life. Uh, he's got to make some decisions in his church that he's, uh, you know, not entirely come. I don't know if you deal with this stuff, but let me tell you about some of the things that I'm dealing with. And, and you've been in ministry a lot longer than I, and, and everybody needs a mentor. Everyone needs someone. Iron sharpens iron, right? So uh, I shared with him the challenges that I face with in my quiet time. When the enemy goes, uh, nobody's going to show up Sunday because they don't want to hear you talk. When the enemy says that, you know, you need to go on a diet, the enemy, tell him he's right. Tell him he's right. Let's go to Psalms chapter, uh, no, 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 we're going to go back into Psalms 27, but we're going to look at verse 9 once more, and I'll continue this conversation in a minute. David says, do not hide your face from me, do not turn your servant away in anger, you have been my helper, do not reject me or forsake me, God my, you know, he's the ruler of a kingdom, he's the king. 
He has people that serve him, people that come to him, and, and everything that he needs. But even David recognized and fought some serious battles. And David recognized that even with his power and authority, he has his own sets of struggles. And he himself realizes that he cannot do this. Without God, we can make it on our own. See, here's the thing. The enemy's smart. Okay? He's, he's a smart, he's, I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah, let's not get into that. The enemy is smart. And he does know that you need and I need God. But what he does is he puts us in these states of disappointment, these states of uncertainty, when he speaks the half truth or the full truth. Devil, you are right. I cannot do this on my own. But by the glory of God, you're under my feet. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that because we are not a defeated people. The victory is already promised to us. David, throughout the book of Psalms, addresses these points. Awareness of the enemy's attacks and God's faithfulness. To Again, as we read this, consider the state of mind that Paul is in versus the state of his circumstances. Any outside perspective would look at Paul in the prison and go, this man is done and defeated and he can't do any more. But in Corinthians 12.10, he says, So, in all this that he's going through, so I take pleasure in weakness, insults, catastrophe. I am strong. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about the power of our testimony. And we've been referring to the power of our testimony being uh, giving us the ability to share our story of how God intervened in our life to an unbeliever or to someone that's not coming to church and to help them with their salvation. After all, of sharing your testimony, that is so, so important. We are not just being a witness, but we can also be an encouragement to others. Our testimonies are here to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now here's the, here's the, the incredible thing about testimonies. I have, a, I have a pretty great story, I like to think. It not seem so dramatic as someone else's, but that testimony is designed to speak to that right person at that right time. So I, I can't emphasize this more. March 11th is going to be a very, very good day. I'd love for you to sign up for this testimony training. It's going to be free, and there's going to be food. Those are my two favorite F words, free and food. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11 in fact you are doing I'd like to share a couple of things that that encouraged me and a couple of quotes that uh, you know take a picture with your phone write it down replay this message a few quotes that really stand out to me your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison your story is the key that can unlock someone else's prison how many of you know that not all keys fit in all holes my testimony, my key, may not be able to unlock someone's prison, but yours might. Your testimony is the story of your encounter with God and what role he's played throughout your life. I was talking with someone just yesterday about healing and about apprehension with healing services. And I very much believe that's a thing. But I also believe that, and we actually got a glimpse of that in the movie that we watched, that sometimes people will be so caught up in the movement that they manufacture healing. So this stands out to me. What God is bringing you through at the very moment will be the testimony that will bring someone else through. No mess, no message. Sometimes when we want healing in our lives and we ask for God to touch us, for God to heal us, for God to restore my vision, I don't think that the answer is ever no, but God understands the methods or the articulations of the universe. And the miracles that happen from us may not be a direct healing for us, but it may change someone else's life. And we do that through the power 
of the testimony. The enemy can say that this thing at Asbury College, this revival that thousands are going to across the country, and Pastor Bob, I don't know if while we play this video, if you can look on your phone, but then it, th th there's places that it's sparked and there's revivals all over the country. I'd like for you to read those off at some point, if you can find it. I'm putting you on the spot. This event at Asbury College that is sparking revivals across the nation, how do you think we're fueling that fire? See, God is moving there, but how are we knowing about it from where we are? We're hearing the news. We're hearing the testimonies. There's a small clip that Pastor Michael shared on Facebook. I cut that down to just a piece. But this lady shared her testimony of her experience, and I am willing to bet this will move you. Julian, if we could roll that, I would be very thankful. And spin a camera to that TV monitor, too. Hey, I just wanted to take a second to share my heart. I felt like it was important. Um, so Brian and I drove up today to the Asbury Revival up here in Kentucky. Um, I've just had a pull ever since I uh, heard about it last Thursday. It was, um, I guess, about 24 hours into it, 36 hours into it. And um, my heart recognized the movement. My heart recognized, God, you're doing something. They're singing How Great Thou Art. They have on violin. Um, so I'm just going to turn the camera around. Right now, I am across from the main chapel, Hughes Memorial Auditorium, which is packed out full of teenagers and young adults. And this whole field in front of it, they have screens set up. And that field is just about full. There's a line waiting. They, I've been told it's a four-hour wait limit or wait line to go into Hughes. But what's so cool? Oh, and there's and there's like three other sanctuaries open up on campus where they're live streaming it, and so you can go inside um, and participate in the worship. Um, what I thought was so neat is we got in one. We saw a shorter line to get into Hughes, and we thought we'll we'll, we'll stand over there. And about that time, they made an announcement that that was the Gen Z line that you had to be 16 to 25 to get to be in that line to get in to Hughes. And y'all, my heart leapt. Okay, so this is my take. The presence of God is tangible here. His presence, it, and during worship earlier, it felt like a weighted blanket all over me. The reverence here that people are giving to the move of the Spirit I think it's interesting too because you can tell this is a little taste of heaven um, so many denominations represented and I don't know that just because I've talked to them because I have it but you can see like with worship styles even there's some people that brought flags and they've got flags going around in the back it's not distracting it's not um, I noticed on the stage in Hughes on, on the video um, there's artwork where people could paint while they're worshiping um, and, and paint what's in their heart. And I thought, how beautiful is that? That's no different than the person on the guitar or on, on the piano bringing their gifts to the Lord, um, bringing their art to God as a worship. It's just so pure. It's just so genuine. God is here. And like with any movement of God, there's spectators. There's some spectators hanging out. But you know, I'm reminded that everywhere Jesus went, not everybody recognized him. And isn't it just like Jesus to come in an unexpected way to his people and to show up for the generation that is supposed to be the one with the least amount of hope, the fatherless generation, the one that we've thrown away, the one that's been the highest levels of depression and suicide and anxiety, they're getting free. Revival will not come how you think it's going to come. And if you try to put it in a box, if you try to do it, ba or if you try to participate based on your limited knowledge of what your denomination has taught you, every one of us won't be able to participate because we're human. How can we wrap around, wrap our brain around what God is doing? Don't be 
those that sit in the seat of the mocker, sit in the seat of the scornful. Be the one whose delight is in the Lord, and you are drawn to wherever he's at. And those who are hungry, if you seek him, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. The testimonies of teenagers getting up here, they also have a time of testimony. And um, they'll, they'll get up and they'll share about how God has been setting them free from a dick, how God's healed relationships with their parents. Um, there was a woman who was set free from a demon. God is here. And God is moving. The spark of revival starts with our testimony. The way we shut the enemy up is by saying, okay, you may be right, but my God is better, and that's how we keep the enemy under our feet. And everything in our life shares a testimony. You know, there can be bad testimonies too. There can be things that throw us down and beat us up. There's those stories. Hollywood is one of those challenging things right now. What is a movie? The movie that we just watched, what is a movie more than a testimony? Jesus' revolution of what happened at Calvary Baptist. And then those few people that would attend that church, they caught fire with God, and their testimony brought more and brought more and brought more. I love that our church is showing the movie industry in Plant City and beyond that we want these. You know, something that we have probably never experienced before. Generation Z is considered a fatherless generation. The values of marriage isn't what it used to be. The nuclear family is not what it used to be. So we have 16 to 23 year olds, to 25 year olds, to 28 that are the same way. But how do we reach those? See, it's easy for us to come to church on Sundays because probably we were raised in church. Or probably something happened in our life that says, okay, Sunday's our time for God. But what about a generation that wasn't raised to understand the power of God's grace and what the cross really means? What do we do about them? Do we talk about them? Do we play videos about them? City to do just that. We're not going to church. We're having church. We're experiencing church. And how you feel and how you share your testimony and how you put yourself in the Word of God and the fruit of your life will bring others either away from God or closer to God. For communion, It'll grab the bread and grab the grape juice and they'll, they'll come from the inside, they'll grab the communion items and then they'll go back out to the opposite sides and go to their seats. As soon as the third row is uh, getting close, come on with the fourth, fifth, and sixth and so on and so forth. But as you're taking communion, don't do it with any frustration in your heart. Don't do it with any anger in your heart. For and if you don't know the love of Jesus Christ this morning, I would invite you to come have communion anyway, but then come and talk with me after. God is here right now. His Holy Spirit lives within us. Let's access that. Let's access that with joy. Let's start after the prayer. Uh, and Phyllis, um, I want to bring you some communion items. But what we'll do while people are coming down the aisle is there's another clip that'll just play in the background some continued testimony of Asbury College. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for your flesh. Thank you for what it represents. Lord, I ask that we take just a moment to wash away the pains and anxiety of love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Pastor Bob, if you'd like to stay up here and pray for those as they're walking through, you're welcome to do so.